Um, my name's Aaron Childrick and I work for Reuters. Japan is slowly inching towards uh, its first nuclear restart, restart under new safety rules devised in the wake of the Fukushima nuclear disaster. Even so, it's not hard to find critics of the new safety regime and um, how the, the regulator is going about it. It's obviously a very difficult task in relicensing all of Japan's nuclear plants. We have two of those critics with us today. On my immediate right, we have Satoshi Sato, who is a former nuclear engineer with uh, GE and a, a critic of, of the NRA and its approach. Uh, to his right is uh, Professor Katsuhiko Ishibashi, who is probably known to everyone in this room because of the warning he gave after the 2007 earthquake damaged the Kashiwazaki Kariwa nuclear plant. Um, I won't spend any more time introducing these two, apart from uh, introducing Eileen uh, Miyoko Smith on further on the right, who will be doing some translation for us. Thank you very much, Eileen. Um, so first of all, we'll hear from Sato-san, and then uh, Ishibashi Sensei, and then we'll open the floor to questions. Once again, <coughs> good afternoon, everyone. Um, <coughs> first of all, I'm not. Um, a seismologist, uh, assuming uh, none of you here uh, seismologist or geologist either, I think it, it is beneficial for all of us to spend the next uh, 10 minutes or so to equalize the level of uh, the knowledge about um, <coughs> some important and basic terminologies of uh, earthquake. Uh, for example, <coughs> when speaking about the design basis earthquake, people say <coughs> uh, 0.3 G or 30% of gravity of G. <coughs> Um, but we don't really understand what it means. Um, say we have a huge earthquake right now. Um, what specific the attributes of earthquake do you worry about? Uh, you don't worry about the location of the epicenter. You don't worry about the, the Richter scale number. But you do care um, how hard you are shaken or how long you are shaken. Uh, how, how long you are shaken, um, the answer to that question is pretty straightforward. It's um, the start of the earthquake to the end of the earthquake. But uh, how hard you are shaken, um, require, the answer to that question requires some scientific the definition rather than casual expression of how hard you, know, you, you are shaken. Um, <clears throat> so we use a <coughs> the seismic acceleration um, to express how hard uh, we are shaken. But uh, it depends on the nature of uh, the piece, piece of equipment. Say I'm a piece of equipment installed somewhere in the reactor building with a bunch of friends from a short guy to, to tall guy. <laughs> and <clears throat> say my natural frequency is one cycle per second. And <clears throat> my floor is uh, vibrated at the same cycle, then I'm shaken hard. But the rest of the guys may not. Say my, my, my floor is now vibrating at uh, 10 cycles per second. I don't feel high acceleration, <clears throat> but uh, the short guy, shortest guy A feels very strong, you know, the acceleration. Likewise, uh, when my floor is uh, vibrating at uh, <clears throat> 0 0.1 cycle per second, the, the tallest guy here, the B, uh, feels the strong the acceleration. But I, I feel maybe nothing. The complexity of, of uh, the real, real seismic wave, um, it is composed of a full range of uh, free, the frequencies with a variable amplitude in all directions, up and down, north to south, and west to east. End result is everybody is shaken, but with a different acceleration. So you may ask a question. If everybody feels acceleration differently, who is telling you how much PGA, or peak ground acceleration is? And when somebody say PGA is 560 gal, which guy is telling you so? The answer is this guy, the shortest guy. But where is this guy? He's on the top of... Uh, the ex excavated uh, um, the ground free field before constructing a reactor building. 
then you may want to ask a question, why do you ignore other guys? No. Actually, we do, we do not ignore anybody. We treat everybody equally. How? We use a response spectrum to cover an entire range of frequency or period. Sometimes in this way. Again, I have a, a bunch of um, the guys reporting to me how individual guy feel the acceleration. So I plot um, the whatever acceleration they feel on this graph to, to have a spectrum. This is the response spectrum. But mostly in this different format. A little bit complicated, but the basic idea is the same. So now, new question, how do, you, do I read the PGA, the peak ground acceleration from this diagram? The same. <clears throat> they read the acceleration at the highest frequency or lowest period. Uh, again, I have a bunch of the guys reporting um, the acceleration to me. And the, the shortest guy uh, tells me the PGA. But <clears throat> the important thing here is that the PGA is not the sole important parameter. We must care about the whole spectrum. By the way, <clears throat> Uh, we know from our experience, the longer wave, uh, the light wave or sonic wave, whatever, that travels further with less attenuation. This is generally true of seismic waves, like illustrated here. <clears throat> so this means the high magnitude long distance earthquake could significantly contribute to the low frequency region of a <coughs> response spectrum. And then <clears throat> the question is, <clears throat> where does such an earthquake come from? We know the answer. It mostly comes from plate interfaces. Also, we know the duration of a high magnitude earthquake is longer than that of a low magnitude earthquake. The long duration earthquakes are more destructive. You know why? <clears throat> the degree of destruction or damage is some, somehow proportional to the value CAB, cumulative absolute velocity, which is time integral of uh, acceleration spectrum. So. The longer duration of the earthquake is the, the higher CAB value resulting in more damage. Here's the important um, the information I'd like to share with you. There are two reasons why high magnitude long distance earthquakes are so important to consider. They may not be important in high frequency region, but could be significant in low frequency region of a given response spectrum. They could produce much higher CAB, causing more earthquake damage due to longer duration. Once again, a DBA, design-based earthquake, is not defined by peak ground acceleration. It is defined by a ground motion respo <coughs> uh, response spectrum. Spectrum. International viewpoints. There are the three important points here. Um, the first, the high magnitude, long distance earthquake are important to consider, just I mentioned, and we'll be to discuss in detail in the next slide. Uh, let me skip the second one. The third one, <clears throat> the probability of annual ex uh, exceedance of a design-based basis earthquake is to be 10 to the minus fourth or less. Uh, this is uh, the required by IAEA safety guide. What you see here is the two, the acceleration spectrum. The left one uh, represents the one in the lower frequency, and uh, the other one right side uh, in the higher uh, frequency. NRC reg regulatory guide requires to define a single smooth broadband spectrum for the design basis earthquake instead of multiple individual spectra. In line with this procedure, <coughs> uh, NRC defines the controlling earthquake. The controlling earthquake is the earthquake with uh, the most representative uh, the magnitude and uh, the distance from epicenter. But there is a, when there is a contribution greater than 5% of the total hazard for the low frequency, for the distance greater than 100 kilometer, the second controlling earthquake needs to be determined. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, the, from the real one. The, the Bogo uh, nuclear power plant in Georgia, United States. The left, <clears throat> uh, th this shows uh, the contribution uh, to the hazard, overall hazard. Uh, you see uh, the two peaks on the left for a high frequency region. But if you look at the right side, the lower frequency, 
the you see uh, the big uh, the peak uh, from uh, uh, high magnitude long distance earthquake. Uh, in this case, the 7.2 magnitude, 130 kilometer from my epicenter. So <clears throat> we needed to construct uh, the response spectrum for each uh, controlling uh, the earthquake, and then uh, superpose together to construct a single smooth spectrum. That's the design, um, design basis of spectrum. The IAEA expectation about uh, the probability of annual exceedance is to be 10 to the minus fourth or less. Our history is not very beautiful. <laughs> it's uh, 100 times worse than international expectation because we have uh, so many occasions uh, exceeding uh, the design basis earthquake. And we have uh, many examples of significant impacts or damage to both safety related and non safety related equipment in the past. Um, during a Fukushima accident, also the significant impacts were observed. So, <clears throat> what improvements have, me, have been made after Fukushima accident? Did we finally get a single smooth broadband spectrum? Do we now consider a high ma magnitude long distance earthquake in low frequency region? Do we finally meet the probability of annual exceedance less than 10 to the minus fourth? Let's take a look. <coughs> this is from uh, Sendai. You see SS1, SS2, they are not combined together, they are separate, they are treated separately. No smooth, no single smooth broadband spectrum, two separate. NRA did a good job to convince the Kyushu Electric to add extra spectrum, the dotted line here. But you see, it's uh, only a little bit above the line. And <clears throat> anyway, if uh, this is compared to the Diablo Canyon earthquake design spectra, you see this. It's a signif significantly below the Diablo Canyon spectrum. And the duration of the earthquake. The the top one you see is uh, the original, the, the proposed by Kyushu Electric, 540 gal. And again, the NRA was successfully convinced uh, the Kyushu Electric to accept the second one, 620. You may feel good job because their number is six, six, two, 620, whereas the Kyushu's original number was 540. But if you look at the, the duration, it's only a few seconds. The real earthquake duration is 300 seconds in this scale, whereas this one is only 30 seconds, 10 times different. What about uh, exceed <coughs> exceedance, 10 to the minus fourth? Uh, it's, if uh, you look at the dotted line S S2, this does not meet the IAEA expectation 10 to the minus fourth. It's way below. And the credibility of uh, this, the, hazard, the uniform hazard spectrum, uh, if uh, we compare it to a typical US East Coast the spectrum, surprisingly, it's below the US spectrum. So the cred credibility of uh, the uniform hazard spectrum is, um, is questionable. All of a sudden, they introduce the third um, the design spectrum but not for the, uh, the reactor, not for uh, the safety-related piece of equipment. They simply apply it for the, con the design of isolation building, I mean a seismic isolation building, sorry. As, as we expect, the lower frequency region, that this earthquake is assumed to occur um, at the Ryukyu Trench, far away. This is the, uh, what I called High, mag high magnitude, uh, long distance earthquake, okay? So they assumed this, this earthquake, but not for the reactor, uh, reactor building or safety related piece of equipment, only uh, seismic isolation building. But we, as you can see, the lower frequency region, 
the contribution of this earthquake is, earthquake is very significant. Now comparing to SS2, this small, this earthquake looks more significant in terms of uh, CAB. Oh. <laughs> well, any, anyway, uh, my conclusion here is the NIA or Kyushu developed three different uh, the design basis earthquake, whereas the international the community recommends to uh, define a single smooth um, broadband the spectrum to bind everything. So this is a part of uh, the in inconsisten inconsistency with the international the practice. I hope you understand my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've all become scientists very quickly. <laughs> thank you very much, Sato san. Uh, Ichibashi sensei, please, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you very much for inviting me today to, here to the FCCJ press conference. <clears throat> and, and sorry for my bad voice due to uh, some trouble in my throat. Uh, <clears> and my talk is uh, rather narrow range and I concentrate on this topic. Um, <clears throat> Japan's first post-Fukushima approval of nuclear power plant issued by the Nuclear Regulation Authority, NRA, to the Kyushu Electric Power uh, on September last year is illegal, I think. The NRA has violated its own legal regulatory requirements regarding the seismic safety assessment of the Sendai nuclear power plant in southern Kyushu. And <clears throat> this matter was not addressed by the recent uh, Sendai nuclear power plant injunction lawsuit and so still remains a serious, serious issue to be addressed. Uh, <clears throat> formulation of uh, design basis earthquake ground motion DBGM uh, is essential uh, for the seismic safety assessment of nuclear power plants, as explained by Mr. Sato, because it is used for the seismic design of nuclear power plant facilities. And DBGM is called Standard Seismic Motion, SSM, by the NRA. And NRA defines it as earthquake ground motion that rarely occurs, but may possibly occur in the service period of the facility and have a significant effect on it. And as Satosan said, a standard of the annual exceedance probability, AEP, of the SSM is 10 to the minus fourth or less. Uh, <clears throat> the new regulation requires um, <clears throat> the SSM shall be formulated as uh, two kinds. The, the first is the earthquake ground motion formulated with a hypercenter specified for each site. Uh, and second, the earthquake ground motion formulated with, without a hypercenter. And today I'll concentrate on the first uh, ground motion. The earthquake ground motion formulated with a hypercenter specified for each site shall be formulated by selecting multiple earthquakes that are predicted to have uh, significant effects on the site, which is called earthquakes for investigation, EQFI, uh, as to three kinds of earthquakes, inland crustal earthquakes, interplate earthquakes, and oceanic interplate earthquakes. And by implementing the evaluation of ground motions for each selected e EQFI, the Illegality in the NRA's review took place in the selection of earthquakes for investigation. Uh, the consequence appears serious for the uh, standard seismic motion formulation and thus the seismic safety assessment of the Sendai nuclear power plant. And this slide shows uh, Three, three types of earthquakes in terms of plate tectonics. Uh, inland crustal earthquakes within a land plate and uh, interplate earthquakes on the, plate on the interface between land plate and oceanic plate. Uh, and 
sad, sad, sadly, sadly, oceanic intraplate earthquake uh, occurring within the oceanic plate. And uh, this part of uh, the oceanic plate, uh, a subducted oceanic plate uh, inclined beneath the overriding plate, is called a slab. So, uh, oceanic intraplate earthquake occurring within the slab is specifically called intraslab earthquakes. And in case of Kyushu, uh, the Kyushu Island is situated on, on a land plate. And from the east, uh, an oceanic plate called the Philippine Sea Plate is being subducted uh, beneath Kyushu toward uh, the west. And, okay. and the language of NRA criterion uh, that are predicted to have significant effects on the site uh, for selecting multiple earthquakes uh, for investigation is very b vague. Uh, Kyushu Electric, therefore, set up its own criterion that the seismic in intensities, SI, of earthquakes for investigation to be examined at the Sendai site will be five lower or greater on the Japan Meteorological Agency's intensity scale. So uh, it is appropriate of Kyushu Electric to have specified uh, the criterion uh, like this quantitatively. And this shows uh, the seismic intensity scale used in Japan, the JMA scale. Uh, so uh, five, five lower here corresponds roughly to eight uh, on the modified Markley scale. And uh, please note that although the seismic intensity of five lower seems low for nuclear power plants, this is just the criterion to se select earthquakes for investigation, not the standard seismic motion itself. Uh, Kyushu Electric examined the effects of past earthquakes on the Sendai nuclear power plant according to its own criterion, whether the seismic intensity is greater than five lower or not. And the left map shows epicentral distribution of past, dis past destructive earthquakes in and around Kyushu. And the right here is a plot of earthquakes uh, in, the, in the left map in the magnitude delta field, so uh, ma magnitude on the vertical axis and uh, delta, epicentral distance from the Sendai nuclear power plant on the horizontal uh, axis. And uh, <clears throat> the, the seismic intensity of each earthquake at the Sendai site is a function of magnitude and epicentral distance. And these A, B, C, are uh, empirical curves dividing uh, seismic intensity three around here and four uh, in this zone and five between B and C and six over the curve C. Uh, and Kishu Electric claimed that the uh, sources of the largest interplate and uh, oceanic intraplate earthquakes are far from the site. Uh, their seismic intensities are inferred to be smaller than five lower, not satisfying the Kyushu Electric's criterion. Then Kyushu Electric concluded that interplate and oceanic intraplate earthquakes need not to be selected as earthquakes um, for investigation. So this one, this uh, blue one, is the largest interplate earthquakes in 1662, uh, Kyushu Electric considered. It. And uh, its epicentral distance is uh, about 170 kilometers from the Sendai site, and magnitude is uh, a little bit larger than 7.5, so plotted here. And then it, it, uh, th this plot uh, comes within uh, seismic intensity for region, for belt. So they ignored this one. Uh, and uh, the, the largest intraplate, oceanic intraplate earthquake is this one in 1909. And uh, central distance was 
100 kilometer and magnitude, magnitude was 7.6 and plotted here a little bit uh, the seismic intensity is a little bit smaller than five. So they ignore these two kinds of uh, earthquakes. But th this Kyushu Electric's conclusion is wrong because examination of only past earthquakes violates the NRA regulations. Anyway, like this, a Kyushu Electric form formulated the standard seismic motion of earthquake ground motion formulated formulated with a hypercenter based merely on inland crustal earthquakes, uh, which is called SS1. S but, uh, sorry, I'll skip the explanation of these figures uh, for saving time. Uh, some, something was explained by uh, Mr. Sato, for, especially for this SS1 and SS2. <coughs> uh, the regulatory requirement says plate tectonics, etc., shall comprehensively be considered when selecting the earthquakes for investigations. Investigation. Uh, so, following this regula regula regulatory requirement of examining interplate earthquakes, the anticipated Great Nankai Trough earthquake uh, should have been selected as the earthquakes for earthquake for investigation. And this map is uh, the estimation of maximum seismic intensity distribution by the magnitude 9.0 Nankai Trough earthquake uh, published by the study team in the cabinet office in 2012. And as you may know, uh, this earthquake, uh, this anticipated great Nankai Trough earthquake uh, has been a nationwide concern for these years. The seism seismic intensity around uh, Sendai in this map, so Sendai is right here, uh, reaches five lower. This blue shows five lower, uh, which meets the Kyushu Electric's criterion of earthquake for investigation. And moreover, this is probably an underestimation for the nuclear power plant's standard seismic motion with uh, annual excedence probability of 10 to the minus fourth to 10 to the minus fifth. Because this mapping was only an estimation for the purpose of obtaining a general picture of seismic shaking that would occur nationwide. So a specific close examination is required for the, the estimation for the Sendai nuclear power plant. And the earthquake for investigation related to this Nankai Trough earthquake would have a more stringent source model than that of the study team for this map. And uh, Kyushu Electric tried a preliminary evaluation of ground motion from the Nankai Trough earthquake. But the evaluation was very insufficient and not included in the application to the NRA. So uh, Mr. Sato showed uh, an, an example uh, of uh, ground motion due to the Ryukyu Trench earthquake. But uh, the, ap the application describes only this Ryukyu uh, Trench earthquake, uh, ignoring Nankai Traff earthquake. Uh, and I'll, I'll skip again this uh, slide, but anyway, uh, the treatment of this Nankai Trough earthquake is very, very, very insufficient. And uh, taking the Nankai Trough earthquake into account is indispensable in the formulation of the standard seismic motion for the Sendai nuclear power plant. And generally, for the seismic uh, the standard seismic motion, uh, as Sato, Mr. Sato explained, not only the peak ground acceleration, but also frequency, overall frequency characteristics and duration times are very important. And if the ground motion due to the uh, M magnitude 9 class Great Nankai Trough earthquake is formulated by setting up the possible maximum fault parameters, then the ground motion may exceed SS1. 
uh, and the duration of the, gr the ground motion of the anticipated Great Nankai Trough earthquake is surely very long. And uh, these figures, uh, the appearance is much different from uh, Sato-san's slide, but the same as shown by Sato-san, uh, SS1H and SS2H. Uh, so the waveforms wave of the Sendai nuclear power plants, SS1 and SS2, are uh, simulated by Kyushu Electric. Uh, so time, time axis is, uh, time range is very much uh, shortened. And as you, as you can see, duration times are extremely short compared with, oh, compared with this waveform. This is uh, uh, the waveform observed, obtained uh, at Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Uh, the, the time axis of these three figures, uh, the, the scale is the same. So this is just 30 seconds. So 30 seconds is here. And so this time axis range, range is 250 seconds. So uh, such a repeating strong ground, ground motion for a long time uh, affects very severely to the nuclear power plant. And uh, as Sato, Mr. Sato said, uh, the peak ground acceleration of uh, SS2, uh, 620 gal, appears here, but just a moment. So, uh, what I emphasize, what I want to emphasize is taking the Nankatra earthquake is, into account is indispensable. Uh, and concerning in, intra slab earthquakes, uh, since the slab exists beneath the whole, Kyushu, whole of Kyushu from north to south, uh, I, I'll again skip the, the, the explanation for these figures. But uh, uh, so the, these show the vertical cross se section of earthquakes uh, in these three belts. So th this black part shows uh, uh, slab, so subducted Philippine Sea Plate. So the s slab exists beneath the, the whole of Kyushu from north to south. Uh, so an event like the 1909 uh, mag magnitude 7.6 earthquake uh, here can occur near Sendai nuclear power plant, uh, say around this place A. And so thus, an intraslab earthquake should have been selected, uh, also select, should have been selected as earthquakes for investigation. Uh, so if a magnitude 7.6 earthquake uh, occurs, around here, around A, then uh, the seismic intensity meets uh, the Kyushu Electric criterion. So, so uh, conclusion and some additional remarks. Uh, the NRA review for the restart of the Sendai nuclear power plant, Unit 1 and 2, uh, which overlooked Kyushu Electric's error at the very basic level, violated uh, the post-Fukushima new regulatory requirements, and thus accepted uh, inadequate standard seismic motion, essential for the safety of the plant. And although Kyushu Electric's error was immediately evident from its own explanation in the open review meeting, the NRA uh, made no question or comment regarding this. And the NRA granted final approval merely uh, reiterating Kyushu Electric's claim as it had been submitted to the NRA. And I, myself, addressed the problems uh, I've described to the NRA public comment process. However, there too, the NRA response was merely to reiterate Kyushu Electric's claim as it had been submitted to the NRA. There are many serious defects with the new regulatory requirements themselves, not limited to the earthquake issue. 
So they must be radically revised if nuclear power plants are to be utilized in this country. Uh, it is outrageous that even these inadequate standards are being violated. If such lax review processes continue, sometime at some nuclear power plant, it will be inevitable that there will be an earthquake that far surpasses this uh, standard seismic motion of the plant. And, uh, uh, this, and this could very well lead to a second uh, Genpatsu Shinsai earthquake nuclear combined disaster, which I have been a uh, warning. That's all. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Um, to try and distill that, I think what Sato-san is saying is that the, the regulations that are touted to be the world's best simply aren't and don't match international standards, while Ichibashi-sensei is saying that even by those inadequate standards, the NRA, the Nuclear Regulatory Authority, is not, um, is not uh, fill, fulfilling its own standards. Uh, Eileen, I think you wanted... Uh, Eileen, I think you wanted... Did you... Okay, so we'll open the floor to questions now. Um, yes. Richard. And especially for Richard, one question <laughs> only. Yeah. Okay, if I only get one question. Um, having described these potential earthquakes, could you tell us what their potential physical effect might be on an actual nuclear plant like Sendai? So obviously at Fukushima Daiichi, the catastrophe was caused when a tsunami knocked out the cooling system. Is that the, the kind of thing that might be inflicted upon Sendai by such an earthquake? Or is it more likely to be damage to the reactor flask or something more like uh, exposure of spent fuel rods? In other words, these theoretical earthquakes, what effect could they have in practice on the structure of the Genpatsu? Okay, do you want me to answer that question? <laughs> okay, um, <If> you can. <laughs> sure, <laughs> I try. Um, I made a point that the current approach lack um, integration of the three separate spectrums, all combined together into a single smooth broadband spectrum, right? So <clears throat> the, the postu postulated earthquake um, produce uh, acceleration or displacement more than the way Kyushu Electric defined their design basis earthquake in, in the lower region, uh, we will have uh, potentially damage whatever equipment sensitive to the low frequency vibration, such as, okay, uh, for example, fuel bundle itself has a lower frequency. Overhead crane or fuel handling machine also have a lower frequency. So, so they could be damaged. If the overhead crane is lifting the spent fuel, for example, and the earthquake occurs during that time, they may lead to the dropage of the, the spent fuel cask and disperse radioactivity to the environment without going through primary containment. So that's one scenario. And um, li like this, we, we can um, imagine various situations. You know, the, the fuel, as fuel, as fuel assembly case is uh, probably the most serious one. In fact, um, I don't know if you remember, there was uh, the earthquake, I think August or September in 2011 in Virginia. You remember? Big one. That, that one only the Richter scale of 5 point something, 7 or 8. But uh, uh, that was uh, the big enough to cause uh, the vibration to the uh, North Anna reactor, uh, resulting in the, uh, the big spike of uh, uh, neutron flux or reactor power. Because the vibration disturbs the, the flow Actual, you know, the actual flow through the reactor core um, somehow caused the 
uh, addition of reactivity into the core. So that's something scale, potentially re resulting in a uh, supercriticality. So that, that's another example. And we, you know, the pe people observed that event actually in 2011. So things like that. Okay. Yeah. Question for anyone on the panel, including Ms. Smith, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> uh, since you seem to feel that the court didn't consider all of the considerations of the seismic, is, do you have any plans to petition the court to reopen the case or have a legal avenue in which to get the uh, Kagoshima District Court to rehear your uh, injunction? Well, the currently I, don't, I do not have an intention to intrude that, that direction, <coughs> but uh, I'd like to openly discuss this matter seriously with uh, anybody you know, the interested in it. I think just for a factual um, matter here, it was residents who brought the lawsuit and yeah. it was actually an emergency ruling last week which was part of a, of a wider lawsuit. Yeah. Um, so you, you're yeah. not party to that is my understanding. If somebody, you know, they make a lawsuit, I will support it forever. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I am not a plaintiff in that injunction lawsuit, so therefore um, I cannot respond to that particular question <coughs> because I was not actually the party that uh, 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 that filed the lawsuit. Um, there is a law by which uh, you can file an administrative complaint for a government decision, uh, and this was filed for uh, Sendai um, NRA review. And I am a party of that administrative complaint, and therefore uh, I have also uh, submitted testimony um, in, in explaining uh, about uh, this, the plaintiff complaint with regards to this um, this filing, this administrative complaint. Uh, this administrative complaint uh, was filed um, by many people. Uh, uh, by 1,500 people on November, I believe, the 7th or the 8th of last year. Uh, I gave uh, testimony, uh, my arguments, on January 24th to in front of the NRA, the Nuclear Regulation Authority. Um, so there was, a, first of all, a three months lapse of, after filing to be able to have testified, and then now um, months have, have passed, three months have passed, and yet there is still no response from the NRA regarding the issues that I addressed. Thanks. Thanks for clearing that up, Yuri. Hi, Yuri Homer, Bloomberg News. Um, you pointed out to the problem. I'd like to ask what you think is the cause of the problem. Is it um, that, as previously, um, before the Fukushima, there was a, a lot of criticism about uh, the regulator being complicit with the industry? that they, the regulator isn't independent enough, they just follow what, whatever the companies say. So do you feel that's the case this time, that the NRA is simply taking the arguments of Kyushu Electric without making self-judgment? Or uh, is the fact uh, that NRA lacks the kind of experts that can make their own assumptions and therefore be truly independent scientifically? Thank you. No, uh, uh, I believe that the issue of the regulator being so close um, to the industry um, is, of course, a problem, but that perhaps um, it is not quite as severe as, as it was pre-Fukushima. Um, however, um, under the uh, current uh, administration of, gov of government, uh, with the um, efforts to restart nuclear power as soon as possible, um, Sendai nuclear power plant will, would be the first to restart. And so perhaps um, there is somehow um, a, 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 a feeling of wanting to restart this first rea these first two rea these reactors as quickly as possible, and that there's a sort of a, 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 a uh, uh, kind of a, a given that um, there's a feeling um, within uh, the NRA of wanting to move forward quickly on this. Uh, technically, 
technically speaking, the Senda nuclear power plant site is a little bit more difficult than, for example, uh, the Fukushima site or the Hamaoka site, uh, which would be facing the plate uh, border the, where the two plates meet, or actually on it. Uh, in the case of Sendai, it's somewhat separated from uh, where the two plates meet, so it's a little bit more complicated. But um, And there was one very, um, very uh, knowledgeable, very good uh, seismologist that was on the NRA uh, previously, but I believe that um, he had some kind of like a prejudgment or a pre kind of a prejudice that uh, probably something like this would not happen, that serious would happen, and that uh, he bases judgments on that uh, assumption. But I think that. Um, uh, that it's very important um, to for all of us experts to get away from these kind of uh, prejudgments or of, of assumptions, because um, it's very important to have uh, learned from the Fukushima accident, uh, and that with the Fukushima accident, nobody thought that a magnitude nine type of earthquake could occur in the Tohoku region, uh, and everybody thought, oh no, it can't happen, but it indeed did, and um, therefore. Um, it is possible, ultimately, to have something like that happen. So uh, we have to change our thinking and uh, into believing that uh, you know all these calculations. It, perhaps something like this could happen. So um, that. Um um, the interest slab 7.9, also um, that it, it is actually can happen. Um, and that usually is excluded, but uh, we should not exclude that kind of uh, type of um, earthquake. And that um, for when it comes to seismic capability of the plant and being able to resist earthquakes, we have to be extremely cautious. And, um, and therefore, um, for example, the Nankai Trough uh, er er earthquake, uh, Actually, the cabinet office has examined it, and um, and it actually can be a magnitude nine earthquake, and we have to take this very seriously. Uh, and finally, I would like to say that the um, the uh, model for the source model, um, also the cabinet office, um, it, well, the cabinet office just gave a general picture of the Nankai Trough. But we have to be very specific about the source model because it's a nuclear power plant and examine what the source model will be for that site and that hasn't been done. Uh, so we have to be much more stringent. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned Hamaoka, you mentioned the Fukushima stations. Does this apply to all nuclear power plants in Japan, essentially what you're saying? And by extension, are you saying Japan really has no business to be in nuclear power? Frankly speaking, I think so. <laughs> well, I 100% agree to every point the professor Ishibashi made. But one point I'd like to add: our original question was uh, with regard to cause of a problem, and you pointed out lack of uh, expertise. I agree, and also lack of uh, collaboration or communication with the international communities. Um, like, I, like I showed today, there are so many inconsistencies with the international you know, the practices, standards, and the expectations. So if um, <clears throat> the people in NRA closely work with the international community, they should know about. There's nothing new. I, like I said, I'm not a seismologist. I, I use the common sense, you know, the comparing um, what we have in Japan and what you know the people in the state have, and I, I see so dis you know big different <coughs> disagreement. So what they need is more frequent communication with uh, the international communities. Um, also, the international peer review. Uh, there are <coughs> the existing system in IAEA as well as WANO. Um, but uh, the, Jap the Japanese, you know, the counterparts are not participating in, in those, the, the programs so actively. So they, they lack of uh, the communication, lack of collaboration. That's uh, the, another point I, I wanted to add. Thank you. Sutojits I thought. Ishibashi Sensei, you have been on some of these committees. Uh, uh, expert committees uh, before uh, 2011. So you probably uh, know some of these people personally. Do they not understand uh, 
the problem does Tanaka not understand the problem? Or you probably see them from time to time uh, privately. How do how do they react to your alarming uh, uh, statements? Yes, um, <clears throat> I used to be uh, expert in the atomic atomic energy safety commission, uh, but for example, I don't know at all. あ、ですので。いや、今今はアフターザ、アフターザ福島アクシデント。アフターザ、アフターザ、福島アクシデント。アフターザ、アフターザ、アフターザ、アフターザ、アフターザ、アフターザ、アフターザ、アフターザ、
also the ash will be, you know, the, the, the clogged in the ventilation system filter to the emergency diesel generator. You know how serious, how sensitive to the, um, the ventilation, ventilation system to the emergency diesel generator. You need a real good cooling uh, for the emergency diesel generator. But once the air filter is plugged with the ash, uh, you will quickly, the temperature of the, um, the emergency diesel generator room uh, will go up very, very quickly and shut down. So the combining of both effect, uh, SBO, the station blackout, is possible, well below VEI6. So we need to be careful to all possible scenarios. And I think uh, the judgment by NRA uh, the, the below the the I six, you know, the no trouble at all. I seriously doubt it. Joel, sorry, need next. Joël Lejean, RTL and BFM TV from France. According to what you said, uh, precisely, um, we've been talking about. Um, we've been focusing about the restarting of some uh, reactors like Sendai, but as we've said, there are other reactors um, which are slipping now, and. Providing what you said now, I mean, are there some reactors that we should focus particularly because they could um, eventually um, generate some troubles in case of earthquakes or other things because of, let's say, the the, the fuel which is stored there or you know the the, the, the situation that is maybe not really um, strengthened in those reactors. In other part than Sendai, we have 48 reactors in Japan. Are there some reactors which you think are a danger today? Um, from the viewpoint of seismology, almost all nuclear power plants in the Japanese islands are dangerous, uh, especially uh, several, uh, a few nuclear power plants in the Wakasa Bay region, uh, because there are many active faults and uh, uh, a lot of historical earthquakes, and uh, for a long time, uh, seismic, seismically rather quiet period has uh, lasting. So such such a place is dangerous uh, from the viewpoint of earthquake occurrence. So, and uh, so for example, Kashiwazaki Kariwa and Tomari in Hokkaido uh, and Shimane in the Shimane Prefecture. Yeah, oh, I think almost all nuclear power plants in Japan should be uh, should be examined very very carefully. I I don't say that uh, all of them should be stopped, but but anyway, we must be very careful for almost all plants. Uh, Wakasa, just to confirm, yep. uh, Wakasa Bay is the Fukui, Fukui prefecture, prefecture area. Yeah. Okay. Siegfried Nil Friedens from Germany. There was, a, um, I think, a seismologist in the NRA, but he was removed from the board. So, did it have any consequences for the decision making in the NRA? Um, did it help to lower the standard of the, to make uh, the earthquake security? That's a removal of this, of this uh, seismologist from the board? Well, except that um, the Sendai nuclear power plant NRA review decision uh, was handed down uh, when the seismologist was on the NRA, when he was on the NRA, when he was a member of the NRA. We're talking about Shimasaki, right? Shimasaki. Yeah. Shimasaki. Yes. Okay, Peter. It's uh, Langen at Bloomberg News, this, uh, to Professor Shibashi, the question. Um, as I understand it, you've, you're an academic, of course, but you've made a, a career of warning Japan about earthquake risk, the book you wrote before the Kobe quake, then what you warned after Kashiwazaki, and yet still um, it doesn't seem like your voice is, is heard. So uh, what keeps you going? I mean, <laughs> are, you, are you an optimist? Uh, 
Um, as uh, the um, as Mr. Sheldrick uh, pointed out, um, uh, I did um, I was uh, I did uh, speak at the FCCJ at a press conference in 2007, uh, warning that uh, if um, the concerned voices regarding um, the danger of a nuclear power plant disaster as a result of an earthquake were not heeded. We were headed for a disaster. And just three and a half years after that, a uh, Fukushima Daiichi accident happened. And um, this was extremely um, uh, unfortunate. It, it really um, dejected me very greatly. Um, and that is why um, I do not want to give up. Um, I continue to warn. Uh, I do not want to experience that again. Um, and um, that's why I continue to warn, um, so that this experience of having warned and yet not have been able to stop a disaster would never be repeated again. And that is what keeps me going. Hello. Uh, these aren't my feelings. This is, this is um, really what I think um, is probably true, and that is that the, um, the gods or god of, of this huge nature um, is actually um, warning the people of the Japanese archipelago um, and in steps, gradually, um, and that um, it is hoping that um, but it is warning gradually and gradually, uh, more severely, more strongly. Uh, because, for example, in 2003, um, there was an earthquake that shook nuclear power plant where the design basis went over the SSM, the standard seismic motion went over, uh, but it was okay. I mean, there was no disaster. Then 2007 at Kashiwasaki Kariwa, it hit the plant quite severely. Um, there was very strong um, shaking and um, it was a direct serious hit. Um, and yet the Japanese uh, people did not listen. And then it gave us Fukushima. And this was a huge warning. Uh, but uh, with Fukushima, virtually all the radiation went out to the Pacific Ocean. It was like uh, within, in, the, in the tragedy, there was this huge uh, good luck. Uh, but now I think that it's in stages that, that the gods are warning us that something even more serious can happen um, in this Japanese archipelago. And, um, and of course, nuclear power plant accidents uh, could result not just by earthquake. But what I'm saying is that uh, with this earthquake, it could have an incredible serious effect. And that it has been dishing it out, doling it out, sort of step by step warning us towards something that actually could be incredibly disastrous. Uh, I can see hands up for uh, more questions. Um, we're nearly out of time. Can you take a couple more questions, or do we want to finish at that very chilling warning? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the first one's over here, then I'll take yours, then James. Another question for Ishibashi-sensei. Uh, most of the Japanese seismology, especially what I would call the state seismologists, they have been focusing for decades on the Nankai Trough, meaning the Sea of Japan is hardly studied. Uh, and we had, I think, a very severe tsunami about a thousand years ago in the Fukui, in the Fukui region. Do you believe that because the earthquakes on, on uh, the Japan seaside are much less studied, actually that the nuclear power plants are even more under-designed than they should, than, than in Sendai, for example? or in Hamamako. Uh, uh, regarding uh, what the, the, the speaker just stated, um, yes, um, that is correct. There are aspects that um, the, the Japanese nuclear power plants facing the Japan Sea, um, the concerns have been underestimated, and therefore they are not as equipped. Um, for example, um, the, top, the SSI for Takahama is 540 gal, and for OE plants, both on the Wakasa Bay and Fukui Prefecture, it's around 700 or something. Um, so these are quite low. Uh, figures. Uh, and the reason they are low is that it's basically concerned, it's considered that the Japan Sea, that area, um, there's lower earthquake activity, um, and so therefore there isn't that much of a concern. 
And uh, however, um, with the, uh, the tsunamis, for example, in the Japan Sea, um, although they are considered to be much lower from Fukui further southwest, um, there, are, there are high tsunamis up north um, in the Niigata area, but they're considered lower and will not happen. High tsunamis will not happen, Fukui and, and further southwest. Uh, but it, that, it, you know, that's, that's what's usually understood, but it, it could very well change. For example, there could very well be a very serious earthquake that occurs in the middle of the Japan Sea that could have tremendous, could cause tremendous tsunamis to go all over the shores along the Japan Sea and then, of course, reverberate um, towards uh, Russia, Siberia, that, the other side, too. Uh, and this could very well happen. Uh, and so um, I think that we are not taking this issue as seriously enough and that... Um, um, the, um, the standard for the kind of tsunami that could be expected at the Takahama plant is way too low. Uh, James Sims, a Forbes contributor and freelance journalist. Um, I had a question regarding the uh, diet report. Um, there was, they were, that was basically the only one that spent a great deal of length uh, looking at the potential damage from the earthquake or uh, damage from the earthquake preventing a uh, safe shutdown of the plant. Um, from what I have read and what I've seen, the NRA, as well as uh, utilities, as well as I think most of the global regulators and industry have basically said that we have not been able to find any evidence of damage caused by the earthquake at Fukushima Daiichi. So, uh, you know, the plant it basically did what it was supposed to do in terms of uh, being quake-proof, not tsunami-proof, obviously. Um, so I was just wondering if, if you could both comment on that, um, whether you think there are still more issues that need to be addressed regarding uh, what happened at Fukushima, or that basically we should accept that there was no damage from the quake at Fukushima. Uh, uh, they're always saying that there's um, no proof that um, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant was damaged by earthquake. Uh, but uh, I would like to state that there is no proof that it was not damaged by the earthquake. Uh, there has been no actual examination of, of, of the inside to determine that. Uh, and that's really important. In other words, we do not know. Uh, and um, I think that this issue is very important and it has to be really looked into um, in depth for a long time. Uh, and um, another person who was co-chair with me in the working group uh, and others of us, uh, we colleagues, uh, my colleagues, have, are continuing to research this issue. And um, please um, have good expectations about the kind of results that um, we will be able to uh, produce. Okay, I have um, kind of an objection to your statement that there's no uh, earthquake damage. Uh, seeing that there are significant damage observed at uh, Onagawa, uh, Fukushima Daini, as well as um, the Tokai too. Um, it may be, may be true to say there's no the direct damage to the safety-related piece of equipment, um, but um, the, in combination with uh, tsunami damage as well as uh, hydrogen explosion, there's no way to make an uh, investigation into, the, into that particular plant. But um, with less uh, the acceleration, seismic acceleration, the Tokai 2 experienced uh, the seawater cooling system, which surprised the water to the emergency diesel generator and shut down you know, the, the particular safety-related equipment. And there are many uh, examples, uh, seismically induced flooding. A lot of water, you know, they the flooded due to sloshing effect from the spent, spent fuel pool. And the low pressure turbine damaged so severely. And the uh, fire accident at Onangawa, what else? <laughs> Many, many examples. So it is not accurate to say there's no damage at all uh, at the, the Fukushima Daiichi the plant, seeing so many examples of damage at, at, at other, other sites. It's simply because we cannot make an investigation in that particular site due to high contamination of the accident. Uh, we're 10 minutes over. Do you have time for one more question? Okay. Can anybody on the panel tell me how many lawsuits are pending now, or, in, or estimate how many lawsuits uh, are pending against the utility startups? And 
as you refine your arguments on seismology like you described today, do you expect more su successes than failures? Should I answer that question about the yes, lawsuits? Yes, please, Eileen. Very quickly Thank about you. the lawsuits. Um, <laughs> there are lawsuits filed for every single nuclear reactor um, in Japan. Um, and uh, so that's the answer to maybe that question. And also for the Sendai lawsuit, um, the, the plaintiffs will be filing an appeal. And also the lawyers on the day of that verdict uh, uh, stated that uh, they will be filing a similar types of injunction lawsuit against the Sendai plant in other prefectures in uh, Kagoshima. Thank you very much for that point of clarity, Eileen. And thank you to you both, uh, to all of you. Uh, again, we've heard a very stark warning about the potential for disaster. Um, given Ishibashi Sensei's track record, it might be hovers to listen to him. Could you please all uh, show your appreciation? Thank you very much. I, I have one more thing to do, and that is to give them both uh, honorary memberships for one year. So I hope you'll both come back to the club again. <laughs> in the next thank, you thank, thank you very much again. Okay. Thank you.